Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Welcome to Research Cloud Series Talk. Today, we are honored to have one of the most renowned scientists in cover materials, Professor Rodney Roof from UNIST, Korea, to join us. He will give us a talk for about one hour, and you may prepare your questions during the talk and send it through the BDBD and or other platform. I will collect these questions and discuss them with Professor Ruoff. So first, please allow me to give a brief introduction of a speaker. Professor Ruoff is a UNES Distinguished Professor in the Department of Chemistry and Material Science and School of Energy Science and Chemical Engineering. It directs the Center for Multidimensional Carbon Materials, also known as CMCM, an institute for basic science center located at the Arson National Institute of Science and Technology campus. Prior to joining UNIST in 2014, he was a Cochrea Family Regents Endowed Chair Professor at the University of Texas at Austin from September 2007. He earned his PhD in chemical physics from the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign in 1988 and was a Fulbright Fellow in 1988 to 89 at the Max Planck Institute of Dynamics and Self-Organization in Göttingen, Germany. He was at the Northwestern University from January 2000 to August 2007, where he was the John Evans Professor of Nanoengineering and Director of NU's Biologically Inspired Materials Institute. And he did research as a molecular physical laboratory SR International for six years after being a postdoc fellow at IBM T.J. Watson Research Center. So today, he will give us a talk about liquid metal composite with carbon, F-diamon, perfect CVD single crystal graphene. So please join me and warmly welcome Professor Ruoff. Okay, thank you, Professor Hu. I'll share my screen in a moment. Okay. Okay, can you see it? Uh, not yet. Uh, maybe I haven't shared, so let me go back. Yeah. Uh, let me see, share screen, there we go. Okay, take your time. Uh, here. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Professor Hu. And uh, this is my first experience with Research Cloud. It sounds like a very interesting forum. And so uh, I'm going to talk indeed about liquid metal composites, uh, a pathway towards and achieving F diamine. And now that our work is recently published on um, fold free single crystal uh, graphene. I, I also added that to the title as Professor Hu noted. So if I may, I'd like to give a very brief introduction to UNIST and the IBS because we are both 10 year old now, uh, so somewhat new. Uh, I'd like to talk about transparent peer review just very briefly during the talk. So it may be something that people have not yet heard of. And so I wanted to mention that I'm a very big advocate of transparent peer review since it was used by nature in our recent uh, publication. So it was quite enjoyable. For me, it was like a huge breath of fresh air after some uh, difficult and quite unprofessional reviewing experiences that we've had in the past four to five years. Then I'll segue to talking about liquid metal composites with the carbon fillers. And then these four topics listed here actually build up to our ability to have AB stack bilayer graphene, which is the appropriate precursor for making diamine, which could be hydrogenated. In our case, we chose to fluorinate, so F diamine or single layer diamond. Now these have many other interesting aspects, but for today's talk, I'm sort of presenting 
a pathway that led us to the ability to grow large enough area AB stack bilayer graphene. Uh, so you'll you'll see that. And then I'll I'll segue to the final topic of fold free, add layer free, wrinkle free, large area single crystal graphene that we also achieved on a particular type of copper nickel foil. So UNIS, the Ulsan National Institute of Science and Technology, as I mentioned, we just had our 10th year anniversary. We are down in this southeast part of South Korea. Actually, we're located about right here, so a little bit south of the center of Ulsan City. And the Center for Multidimensional Materials, this Institute for Basic Science Center, is at the UNIST campus along with two other IBS centers, as I'll mention in a moment. So we have a, a lovely setting in a kind of countryside outside of Ulsan with a nice lake in our center. As you can guess from the title of the university, Science and Technology, we are actually uh, focused on uh, science and also engineering research. And as a IST, we are the fourth IST in Korea. So many of you have probably heard of KAIST, Korea Advanced Institute of Science and Technology. And then also in Gwangju, there is just Gwangju Institute of Science and Technology. And in Daegu, there is DGIST. Now in Ulsan, there is UNIST. Now the IBS was instituted 10 years ago in Korea, modeled something like the Max Planck Institute, but it's really its own Korean version of sort of a basic science institute. And as you let your eyes scan over the names of the different centers that are categorized, as you see here, you can see that the centers are focused on sort of forefront scientific areas. And the goal is to embed basic science, but particularly long-term basic science research in Korean culture, because of course there are very talented people at the national labs and the universities who have been doing excellent basic science. At UNIST, we also have uh, the Center for Genomic Integrity and the Center for Soft and Living Matter. So we have three centers that are located on our campus at the, at the university. So these 31 centers uh, are sort of located in different parts of Korea. And, and so they are building up this basic science capability in Korea. So very briefly about transparent peer review, uh, the idea of transparent peer review is that the process of the reviewing of a manuscript that a group of authors submit to a journal is relatively transparent and is meant to be, if it works well, really well managed by a professional uh, editor. And so if we have that happening, then we don't have strange situations where particularly young scientists get hurt and damaged. So since two of my topics today actually didn't have TPR and had highly unprofessional aspects that we had to deal with until we finally published, I thought I could use today's talk partly to emphasize that I'm a really strong advocate of TPR, Transparent Peer Review, which actually our Nature publication that just came out was done with this sort of new process for Nature TPR. But other journals are doing this now also. Okay, now let's talk about uh, composites containing non-metallic fillers, but particularly carbon-based fillers with liquid gallium, but also it's eutectics with gallium, such as with indium, gallium with tin, and gallium with indium and tin. These are the co-authors who worked on this, uh, which we published in January 1st issue of Science Advances. So with uh, our putty-like material that comes from taking liquid gallium and mixing with different carbon fillers, we can make these sorts of different shapes as I'm going to talk about today. 
And it, I'm going to briefly cover some of the aspects that we learned about why we could create these sorts of putty-like composites in situations where uh, you cannot create the putty-like composites with these sorts of liquid metals. So this uh, project was launched with Chun Hui sort of leading the way in part because Yan Gong made a, a kind of accidental uh, discovery or observation. So Yan mentioned to me one day that uh, in a different project that I can't talk about because we haven't published on it yet, she noticed that graphene oxide sheets or platelets of stacked graphene oxide from graphite oxide dispersion seem to be well wet by gallium. So I should mention that graphite, that is to say pure carbon, and also diamond do not wet by these sorts of metals. The surface tension of liquid gallium and also indium and mercury for that matter that we didn't work with here uh, are so high that they are not going to wet those sorts of materials. Uh, it's been experimentally observed and studied. Now, the question then arose, why did the graphene oxide seem like it was wetting? So that spurred me to ask Chun Hui, would you try to see if you can mix and make a new type of composite with a liquid metal? So he enthusiastically dived into that project and at first he mixed by hand, like in a mortar and pestle, but then eventually we started mixing uh, using mechanical devices. So for example, uh, we can mix with the stirrer, we can mix with ball milling. And we ended up learning that as long as we were doing the mixing in air, then we could form these composite putty-like materials in which the viscosity of the liquid metal would change uh, as we added higher and higher filler concentrations. And that at a certain threshold, we couldn't put any more filler in. And so it would sort of be a maximum amount. So if we used ball miller, then instead of doing by hand, we could actually get in, for example, about eight weight percent of the graphene oxide. So here's a little movie. So in that movie, you're actually watching Chun Hui's hands as he manipulates this putty-like material that he's made. Now, there's a number of interesting aspects about these compact, uh, these composites. First of all, gallium, and for that matter, indium, and then the eutectic with tin, they uh, are liquid metals that have very interesting problems uh, or sometimes benefits. So gallium will readily amalgamate with almost every other metal. And that can be a good thing, but it can be problematic also. So if you put gallium on copper, it's going to spread and leave in fact a residue after you remove it. And this is, this is true of essentially all metals and it will spread and also leave a residue even on glass. In contrast, our putty-like material can contact the same four uh, substrates and not leave any residue and not really stick to them. We found that our putty-like material could be cast into essentially any shape. Chun Hui could make it into sheets or into these sorts of rods or these sorts of cylinders. Another really interesting thing about gallium is that it mimics water in its phase diagram, temperature pressure phase diagram. So as many of you know, of course, the typical situation is when we freeze a liquid, the density is higher for the solid, but gallium actually has a lower density. And so once you solidify gallium, which can be a liquid around room temperature because it can supercool a bit, 
But once you solidify it by cooling it a bit more, it actually expands. And this can cause problems in certain applications where you want to maintain the shape at a constant shape. This is interesting that our, we refer to it as plasticine-like or putty-like material would actually maintain its shape after we solidified it without changing its volume. And this happens because there's some extra void space that uh, is near the filler particles that allows uh, expansion to occur into the void space. And so that's our explanation for why the shape can be maintained as constant through some temperature range before you completely liquefy it. So this is an, uh, showing cross-sectional scanning electron microscope images and we label these regions as void. And then you, we see evidence of the graphene oxide and the gallium. And uh, one thing that I want to emphasize and I'll, I'll come to in a moment is we learned that, as I mentioned, we can only make these composites in the presence of air when there would be, for example, oxygen or water vapor. And so the reason why the composites can be made has to do with the coating as we do the mixing. Maybe I'll jump back a bit. So as we're mixing and driving this mixing process, we're actually forming constantly thin layers of gallium oxide that are a few nanometers thick, GA2O3. And it's that gallium oxide contacting the graphene oxide that allows the, or as I'm going to show you, diamond particles and silicon carbide particles and reduced graphene oxide to be constantly mixed in. If we do the same process in a glove box, it doesn't work. The two materials, the liquid metal and the filler material remain entirely immiscible. They will not mix. So it actually only works in air. So Chunhui invented a very nice approach for mixing an RGO because reduced graphene oxide of course is graphene-like and therefore it's sort of like graphite in terms of its wettability. So we can make reduced graphene oxide dispersions uh, in a variety of different ways, chemically, thermally, et cetera. And if we make them separately, uh, and then we tried to mix into the gallium, they would not mix even in air. They could not be mixed. But instead, what we did was we heated the graphene oxide putty-like material, and we saw that it kind of expanded the shape of the object significantly. And this is because uh, we're kicking off carbon monoxide and water and some CO2 as a result of that heat treatment. So there can be interlamellar water molecules present between the graphene oxide stacked layers if they're not individual sheets. And then separately, the functionalities that are on the graphene oxide, like OH groups and uh, epoxide groups like COC, they can come off as these sorts of products. So then you have RGO and it's actually nicely embedded. And by heating and kneading and you know, ball milling again, then we could get RGO mixed in uh, very thoroughly with the gallium or its eutectics and make a putty of RGO in the liquid metals. So this is showing again, this expansion that happens upon heating and how to make this sort of a, a foam-like material. But then when, as I mentioned, processed again, it can be converted back into the putty-like material. So we found uh, <clears throat> that these uh, composites can have excellent EMI, electromagnetic interference shielding performance. So we could coat them onto A4 paper, or we could coat the putty-like material as a very thin layer on RGO film, for example. And I won't go into great detail, but as we report in our paper, the EMI shielding is very effective. 
<clears throat> I then suggested we try mixing in diamond because diamond has the highest thermal conductivity of any material. Uh, and we found that there was a size effect present. So if we tried mixing in below a certain size of the diamond particles, they weren't mixable. We since have sort of invented a technique that we'll publish in the future where we can mix any size in. But at least for this paper, for this work described here, we could not mix in particles below about eight microns. And so once we get to the larger size, then they were miscible. And uh, we present a, a sort of a simple model about why that's the case, but I'll describe it in words. <clears throat> The, graph, the gallium oxide skin-like uh, material that is going to help bring these uh, filler materials into a mixture in this composite, that thin layer of oxide has a certain mechanics. And if the particles are very small, uh, it can't conform very well to coat them. And that influences the ability to mix properly with the liquid gallium. And so there's a roughness aspect from these small side particles that needs to, in a sense, be overcome. And in this work, we actually did not have a means to do that. And so there's a certain particle threshold that can be mixed in or larger. And so we have cross-sectional TEM and we find from STEM EDX, for example, that that thin layer of gallium oxide that I've been describing to you is observable between the large diamond particles and then the, the gallium that typically we, in this sort of work, we would have as solidified for the TEM. And so we prepared these sorts of samples by the standard technique with SEM FIB preparation to generate the cross section. And you can see that uh, you know, we have, of course, carbon present where the diamond is, and then some oxygen distributed uh, very, very little, of course, where the diamond is, and then showing that we have gallium present. So the thermal conductivity jump was quite impressive. Uh, this uh, thermal conductivity of pure gallium is, 40 watt per meter Kelvin at room temperature. And so we could boost through adding diamond particles up to about 120 watt per meter Kelvin. And we also saw a significant jump with our geo sheet. Uh, was one interesting difference is that the sheets tended to align in the film that we generated so we could make measurements of the thermal interface and also of uh, the thermal diffusivity or thermal conductivity. And so with RGO, we had a highly anisotropic response. Perpendicular was much lower than parallel. For diamond, however, it was essentially isotropic. <clears throat> this is showing the different particle sizes of the diamond. Now you can see the heat spreading is working significantly better for the diamond filled composite than for the pure gallium. And so it looks like a very promising material for TIMS, thermal interface material, and maybe for other applications involving increasing thermal conductivity. It was an interesting challenge here, which is that as the diamond particles get quite large, uh, you can end up with a small gap between your thin film and what you're trying to cool, for example, because the particles are projecting out. There is a, there's a couple of ways to overcome that, but we didn't really describe them in this article. So I would certainly like to acknowledge uh, colleagues at UNIST and mention that one of the benefits of being at UNIST, uh, I feel, is that we must study basic science because that's what our funding is for. So as we look at possible applications like TIMS and so on, it's very valuable to collaborate with people who are really expert. So Professor Lee actually has configurations that meet industrial 
standards for Tim's measurements and Gunho Hitkim and his postdoc Shalik happened to be expert in thermal conductivity measurements. We could tap into their knowledge as well. I'd like to also thank all of the colleagues shown as co-authors. So very briefly, you can just simply read through this. I won't say anything. I'll just wait for you to read it. <laughs> So one of the reviewers did something entirely incorrect. That could have been never happening, I think, if science used transparent peer review. So do I think our work should have been published in science? Yes, I think it should have been, but that's could be debated, I guess. All right, now let's go on the path toward diamine and uh, talk about a series of uh, efforts that we had in our center that led toward this. One thing we've done is we've invented a method to convert a uh, large area polycrystalline metal foils to single crystal metal foils. And this was led by Dr. Sungwon Jin, a postdoc on our team with uh, important involvement by many, many other colleagues. And so briefly, uh, many of you are probably familiar that if you have a typical piece of metal or ceramic, et cetera, it's typically polycrystalline. And that's true of the foils that are made and used in massive quantities around the world. So this is electron backscatter diffraction data. And all of these different colors mean different orientations of those individual grains. Each one of the grains is a little crystal, but they have completely different orientations. And then there are grain boundaries between the grains. So we've learned uh, that if we hung large pieces of foil in a large tube furnace, and we expose that to argon with some hydrogen mixed in, under certain conditions, we can reproducibly convert, for example, copper polycrystalline foil to single crystal copper foil. And the in-plane and out-of-plane measured at different spots by EBSD are showing that we have one giant single crystal with out-of-plane orientation 111. This can also be shown by measuring the X-ray diffraction pattern in many different spots. So if you have a single crystal substrate and it happens to be lattice matched to graphene or also diamond for that matter, or HBN or cubic boron nitride, then of course it can be useful potentially for epitaxy. And indeed we and others find that on such single crystal foils, nucleation and then growth of islands uh, we can learn that all of these islands are essentially epitaxial with very few exceptions. And then if we grow a continuous film, the low energy electron diffraction pattern that is acquired also demonstrates that we have large single crystal graphene <coughs> on the large single crystal copper foil, for example. It's a totally different story uh, for growth on polycrystalline copper. We were able to do this with nickel and cobalt and also platinum and palladium. So five metals that are closest packed metals. Uh, we have a paper published that I won't delve into today on iron, which is body centered cubic that we were able to show under different processing we could convert to single crystal iron foils and we found, however, that the more ready conversion with our technique uh, is happening with the closest pack metals, typically face centered cubic or cobalt is hexagonal closest packed and undergoes a martensitic transformation as we raise temperature to FCC. And then back at room temperature, we might expect it to be HCP 
Now with platinum, uh, we didn't use an oven at first because its melting temperature is pretty high around 1,770 degrees Celsius. So we actually use dual heating and that's why these regions are remaining polycrystalline. They were where the foil was strapped in, connected in to water-cooled electrodes. <clears throat> and then we resistively heat, we run current through. So I squared R heating, dual heating, heats up the foil. We have a pyrometer observing the center temperature. Once we got to a little bit below the melting temperature as we did for cobalt and nickel and copper with appropriate ovens for them, we found conversion to again, one, one, one out of plane. More recently, we've acquired an oven that allows heat treatment uh, of platinum and palladium directly in the oven. So we can do much larger foils and get this conversion happening. Another thing just for the science that was very important about platinum is we had this <clears throat> started to believe there was something very important about having hydrogen present. So without the presence of some hydrogen in the argon gas, copper, nickel, and cobalt would not undergo this conversion to single crystal. But when Sung Wan was doing the experiment, he accidentally left the hydrogen off in one run with platinum, and yet we got a very nice conversion. And so then we realized, oh, this is interesting. Why does it work well? <laughs> Turned the hydrogen on, it also worked well. Well, it turns out that for platinum and also palladium, the activation enthalpy for vacancy formation, which is uh, typically uh, caused by hydrogen at the grain boundaries in metals is not really changed. So it's already pretty low without hydrogen in these metals. And so the addition of hydrogen doesn't really make much difference. In contrast, in copper, nickel, and cobalt, the activation energy for vacancy formation is quite large, but hydrogen lowers it substantially. So hydrogen is a kind of lubricant, if you will, for formation of vacancy, and vacancy formation is critical for the grain boundary movement. So the movement of the grain boundaries is needed if we're going to be able to have particular grains growing at the expense of others. So this uh, led to uh, adding nickel, as I'm going to describe briefly to you. And these papers with Ming Huang as first author uh, describe our work in making these copper nickel 111 alloy foils that are also single crystal over large area. And this is very critical for our recently published work that I'll come to at the end of the talk. <clears throat> so I suggested to Ming, a graduate student in material science and engineering, and also my first PhD graduate at UNIST, let's try to electroplate nickel on the outside of our copper foils. And then we'll try to anneal and see if we can get maintain single crystal, but adjust nickel composition in this alloy foil. Unfortunately, this all worked very well, but when we started, we didn't know if it was going to work well. There was reason to think that it might because copper and nickel are adjacent to each other in the periodic table. They're both about the same size. Uh, they have been shown to be over the years completely miscible from zero to 100%, sort of a textbook example that's in material science textbooks. <clears throat> but in any case, we needed to do the experiments. And there's one very nice thing about electroplating. Ming would weigh the copper foil beforehand and uh, very accurately get the weight, and then he would weigh it afterwards. But another nice thing about electroplating is every time a nickel two plus ion arrives at the cathode, two electrons get donated to it, which are recorded uh, in our system. 
So the integrated current during the experiment tells us very accurately how much nickel we have plated. And this was cross reference to our mass measurements before and after plating. So it might interest you that we can actually control the nickel concentration in these alloy foils, I think to three and a half significant figures. So later when I show you the results on our single crystal monolayer graphene, it was important that we use 20.0 atomic percent uh, nickel for the conditions we found that would grow the graphene as, as we succeeded in growing. So it gives you a very fine control over the nickel composition in the copper foil, in the, co in the alloy foil, excuse me. So after heat treating, we see a shift in XRD peak and we can do electron backscatter diffraction and so on. We find, well, fortunately it does remain a single crystal. So some of you might be aware of other publications or simply generally aware of the fact that there are so-called copper nickel foils that are made in massive quantity. For example, they're made in massive quantity in China and they are called 90-10 or 80-20 or 70-30. And that means 90% copper, 20% nickel, but they have other elements that are present. And so for example, in a 90-10, a this shows the composition of these other elements or a 70-30. This shows the composition of the other elements that are present. These other elements are deliberately added to these quote, copper nickel commercial foils because the primary use is in ocean or maritime applications in which we want to protect something from corrosion by seawater. And so copper and nickel alone don't quite do the job. So we actually had some early papers that used those commercial foils. And this was already teaching us that, you know, that as you add more nickel, you can get more than monolayer and so on. So the point is the reason for adding the nickel is that the solubility of carbon in pure copper at let's say a thousand degrees Celsius and copper melts at 1,085 degrees Celsius, the uh, solubility is a few parts per million. But if we add nickel, we can increase the solubility of the carbon. And at 100% nickel, the solubility at 1,000 degrees Celsius would be a few atomic percent. And so it's very interesting. You can go from PPM up to you know, roughly a few atomic percent. Of course, nickel has a much higher melting temperature around 1,550. So these alloy foils can be very valuable. And I wanna to mention to the audience that I think the ability of the community to make single crystal foils, for example, of copper with a variety of uh, Miller indice HKL out of plane orientations and then to add other elements to them and study, can you keep it a single crystal? And there'll be benefits to adding other elements like silicon and so on. This is a vast area that hasn't been explored at all and I think is very exciting. Okay, so one of the things Ming did along with all our talented co-authors is at a low nickel concentration, low, we had to learn what low was, then we could grow monolayer graphene from methane. And it would grow much faster than on pure copper because the nickel is much more catalytically active. There's some other fun things about this particular study, uh, but just briefly, we have ways of showing that we have very nice monolayer graphene with Raman spectroscopy. So this is sort of now due to work by Raman physicists and spectroscopists and others, a kind of gold standard for ascertaining, for finding out, you know, what's the quality, so to speak, of our graphene. So doing things like making a map 
of the ratio of the intensity of the D peak to the G peak, it's essentially zero here, or the full width half maximum of the 2D peak. That means each pixel in the map, we're grabbing this from the spectrum and plotting it. So the, you might wonder what the dark specs are. Those are not controllable. They are due to cosmic rays hitting the CCD detector. And uh, if you ever see Raman maps that don't have any of these dark specs, it means they were acquired pretty quickly. And so over several hours, uh, we have these dark specs present. So these maps are showing we have a very high quality graphene. The growth could be very, very fast. But one thing that was really interesting was that we could grow the single layer graphene without any add layer between about 0.5% nickel, or we can make a, all the way up to about 9.5 atomic percent nickel. And any of those foils in that range would always grow the single crystal graphene. And our collaborator now, Professor Hyun Sub Lim, uh, he's actually, I need to update the slide. He's now at just in Guangzhou, discovered through doing low energy electron diffraction that we have a, a superstructure at the surface. And remarkably, the phase diagram will probably be eventually worked out for this, but this copper six nickel one, thus with 14.3 atomic percent and a periodic arrangement on the surface is present even if we have 0.5% in the bulk or up to about 9.5%. When you go above 9.5%, this disappears and we probably have something else on the surface, but doesn't seem to be periodic. So this is really quite remarkable. We actually have two different orientations that can be present over our single crystal surface. And we can say that this superstructure is one to two atoms thick because Hyun Sup dialed down the primary electron beam kinetic energy. And so by lowering it and lowering it and lowering it, we get more and more surface sensitive. We can say it's not three atoms, but we can't distinguish between one and two. Okay, now if we up the nickel concentration, so Ming undertook a parametric study and varied the nickel concentration to higher values. Then when he goes up around 20 atomic percent, uh, nickel 23 atomic percent, et cetera, then he could get mostly bilayer graphene, which was almost entirely AB stacked. And this is happening because we have a single crystal substrate that epitaxial growth is occurring on. So these are the colleagues who contributed to that work that was published as shown here. And the maps again show that we have a very high quality. Now comes the effort to take that AB bilayer graphene led by Dr. Pavel Bakarov and our team and try to convert it into diamine, which had never been and has never been done by any other group experimentally than ours. And so uh, what we did was we home built a system in which we have xenon difluoride uh, sitting in a little container. We mildly heat this vapor is transported into where the sample is held and we can heat treat this mildly we found worked well and then trap any of the product. And then we take the sample out and we study it. And so this is what Pavel originally, Manav Saxena worked very closely with Pavel and then Manav moved to professorship in India. So I need to hustle along a little bit and show you guys results. So F-diamine, uh, if we envision what it might look like, uh, theoretical calculations show this to be much more stable than this. But the question is, what experimental evidence can we find if we get a C2F stoichiometry? So I'll have to walk through this a little bit quickly to be able to get to the monolayer graphene part. And so let me just mention that, you know, we had a, a theory paper out of UNIST back in 2013, but the first paper on this topic on theory was by Leonid Chernozatonsky and colleagues who, who named the material diamine, a mixture of the word diamond and alkane. 
And so they talked about hydrogenated diamine, for example, C2H. And in this study, we theoretically evaluated on copper 111 and nickel 111 and cobalt 0001, the HCP surface of cobalt, all of which are epitaxial to multilayer graphene. Could it form in principle with bonds perhaps forming to the surface? And the answer is yes. And so this is also an interesting theory work. So coming straight to the punchline, these beautiful cross-sectional images were obtained by Sapu Li and Zheng Hun Li's group at UNIST. And you see the AB stack bilayer graphene on the copper nickel 111, which is coated on top with uh, extra material that makes it stable from creating a cross-section specimen. specimen. And then when Pavel would fluorinate, it turns out the fluorine would leak underneath, so to speak, the xenon difluoride and the bottom layer would also get fluorinated. And a deep analysis of these sorts of cross-sectional TEMs shows that we have made the C2F form that is the form I showed you on the left here. And so it turns out that the average C F bond distance is exactly the same value that you have, for example, in CF4 or C2F6 in those alkanes. And the average value of the buckled carbon plane separation is exactly the value that happens to be present in diamond. Now, as you look locally in TEM and assign those distances, there's a little bit of variation. And that's not because the CF bond distance is changing, it's just the reality of doing TEM. So these beautiful images shown here show the actual raw data and then when Sakwu filters and then simulated, the simulated intensity variation versus the filtered are essentially perfectly identical for the different orientations. We also took eels in TEM and the eel spectra are shown, and then also the calculated eel spectra are shown in green. And those were calculated uh, by Sehun Ju in uh, Professor uh, uh, Kwok's group, uh, our collaborators. And so there was a quite good agreement for the eels too. There's an interesting situation where we have trilayer happens to be present. And so we're not saying that on this copper nickel grown by Ming Huang, uh, that we have perfect AB over multi square centimeters. There are regions where there could be trilayer and some gaps where there might be monolayer. And so we found one of those by optical microscopy prior to exploring fluorination. And so there's a little patch of single layer right here, which is shown from the Raman. And then the standard bilayer AB stack is found everywhere else. But in this region, there's trilayer, which is ABA. Now it turns out we need ABC. Otherwise, the third layer of carbon atoms in graphene are in the wrong places to allow the tetrahedral sp3 bonding to form between those two layers. And sure enough, after we fluorinated, we had clear evidence that this could not this trilayer region did not convert to diamine. It's still called dia, so don't think of two for dia. That means more like diamond-like. So we didn't get the three-layer diamine because we had ABA, and that was sort of expected, but quite interesting, I think. I won't have time to go into the beautiful long story, but I encourage all of you to read the paper uh, in detail if it interests you, because it was Pavel's strategy to use fluorine instead of hydrogen because of XPS, not that we were immediately going to be going to use TEM. TEM is very challenging. And you've got to be pretty sure of your samples before you go and bother the TEM experts to do that difficult cross-section preparation and so on. So our strategy was we would use X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy and I want to note a couple of things. First of all, hydrogen does not have 
an XPS signature by itself. There is no H1S part of the XPS spectrum. Secondly, in the C1S region of XPS, the CH bond peak is identical to the CC interlayer bond that we want to be forming in the diamine. When I say identical, I don't mean the peaks are identical. I mean, they're in identical positions in terms of the energy. And so you cannot discriminate those and that would be very challenging therefore. But the CF peak is in a totally different peak position in the C1S region than the CC bond. And so by doing normal emission and also tilting our samples, we could learn quite a bit about the composition and eventually through such studies with X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy, including of the F1S region, it was possible for Pavel to realize a sample that had the C2F stoichiometry. So for example, uh, this is showing you the F1S region that we had very valuable information from. And I, I don't have time to go into all details, but this complicated ratio shown here actually tells us for the different samples what the atomic percent of fluorine is that's present from the C1S as well as C1S ratio to the F1S. So you can see that indeed sample A has very close to the 33 atomic percent expected for C2F. And indeed we found out that that sample was C2F, it was the F diamine. So the XPS was really the workhorse for lining up, finding the proper sample stoichiometry that then could be studied by, for example, TEM and other methods. So this is showing you that uh, there's a sort of a further method of taking ratio uh, at normal emission to at 50 degrees emission, sort of see them in the background here. And when that ratio is 1.0, then you have C2F. And when it's different from 1.0, you have not converted some of the sp2 bonded carbon in the graphene to interlayer CC bonding and converted all of it. Some of it is unconverted because it's not sufficiently fluorinated. Another thing that Pavel did was we measured UV vis and we found the band gap to be about 3.3, 3.4 electron volts for the diamine. Professor Zhang Fen Lu and his colleagues at Peking University have a theoretical paper of the F diamine that shows that strain engineering could be a valuable method. But let me point to just the values of carrier mobility for electron and holes at zero strain. They're very, very high, you notice, uh, sort of a thousand to 3000. So this was quite interesting. Uh, I wouldn't have a priori known what the carrier mobilities might be in our F diamine. We haven't measured that. It's something that should be measured. <clears throat> Another thing I'd like to briefly mention is that um, as we were doing, Sukwu Li was doing uh, the TEM studies, he found that as a function of the electron beam flux, it was possible to defluorinate the F diamine and it would pop back into AB stacked bilayer graphene. So I think in the, in the future, if we make very large area F diamine, there are exciting possibilities for its use in devices. And it's possible that the whole F diamine surface could be written with an electron beam and in certain regions reconverted back to conductive AB bilayer graphene. And then we'd have the band gap 3.3, 3.4 F diamine that has high carrier mobility, simply to mention. Okay, let me just briefly mention <clears throat> very unprofessional behavior by a particular associate editor at Science. So not reviewed, not sent out for review. And then finally, a terrible experience at Nature several years ago. Uh, they didn't have transparent review then. So sort of briefly outlined here. Uh, 
Now nature has transparent peer review, as I'll come to in a moment, but then they didn't. So we turned to nature tan nanotechnology where we could see a professional review. And that's where we ended up publishing our work on F-diamine. Okay, I'll be probably a few minutes past an hour, but I'll quickly go through single crystal large area fold free monolayer graphene. There's some of the co-authors who happened to be on the UNIS campus at the time the photo was taken. So you can find the transparent peer review file here that you might enjoy looking at that. And the way this you'll, you'll see this done is, you know, a little bit of the material was retracted because some of it is private and can't be shown in the TPR file for good reason. And then there was some unpublished data that, you know, we had figures that were copyrighted. But if you read it, you'll clearly understand which paper those came from and you can find the figures anyway. So then you see the reviewer comments and what nature refers to as author rebuttal. So you see the whole history. If the reviewers want to be named, they can be. If they want to remain anonymous, they can be. But if the paper is going to be accepted, for example, by nature, and the authors opt in to transparent peer review, then this will happen. All three of the or four of the reviewers can choose to be anonymous if they want. So not necessarily entirely transparent with respect to their names. In our case, two chose to name themselves and one remained anonymous, which is fine. And then also nature has something called a nature portfolio. And so we have a, you know, some background that we wrote up for that in addition to the publication itself. So a little quick background as it published in these articles here, like ACS Nano and Advanced Materials, we discovered that in our single crystal copper 111 substrates, we always have these folds present. And uh, they happen because a big wrinkle forms at a certain stage and then collapses and falls over. And those are kind of fascinating out of themselves. We're about to submit an article that just talks about the mechanics and other aspects of just the folds themselves. But on copper 111, we have not been able to eliminate these. And so maybe someone will figure out a method to do so, but we turned to our copper nickel foils and changed our carrier gas to ethylene instead of methane. And you know, in the article, you'll see a detailed description about these cycling experiments. But briefly, we undertook growth experiments where we would grow at a higher temperature and then cool to a certain intermediate temperature and then grow again. And this taught us a lot about, you know, when are these folds forming on our surface? And maybe we could grow so they don't form if we just grow a little bit lower temperature. So indeed, uh, we learned that we could grow without folds by uh, growing at a low enough temperature, like around 1030 Kelvin, instead of much higher temperatures like 13 or 1350 Kelvin on this copper nickel alloy foil that has 20.0 atomic percent nickel by growing with ethylene and growing at this lower temperature. As long as we grow at that lower temperature, uh, the tall wrinkles don't form, and we only have what are called ripples. We don't have any wrinkles. They're tiny structures that are about one nanometer in height and about one, one to two nanometers in width. Everywhere else, the graphene is under compressive stress and strain. So the deadhesion forming the folds doesn't happen when we grow at this lower temperature. Okay, so the deadhesion doesn't occur because a certain type of surface reconstruction that drives formation of the tall wrinkles is avoided by working at a low enough growth temperature. <coughs> so we can see the presence of the folds even with an optical microscope and then we can eliminate them by growing at that lower temperature. And we have a lot of details about uh, you know, a strong step toward understanding why the folds form as a function of the formation of bunch steps on the surface. So I encourage your 
your reading of this as a way of uh, deeper understanding of what we have done. So I, I commend, you know, the first authors and particularly uh, my co-corresponding author on this one part, Dalo. And we got some very wonderful advice and discussion with Professor Rui Huang at UT Austin. And we actually included a, an email statement verbatim from Professor Wong in our exchange with the reviewers. And beautiful cross-sectional images are showing why these wrinkles will start to form. And so we capture some of that aspect uh, having to do with the nature of the surface morphology and why the wrinkle will form in the step regions between the plateaus. And so all of that has gone to, into in, in some great detail uh, in our paper. And we're not saying here, I don't want to leave you with the impression that the mechanics is completely solved. So for audience members who are in mechanics community, I encourage you're looking at all of our experimental data and you might have a more complete model you can present in the future. So we could also scale the size. Uh, we increased the size of our nickel plating bath so we could put bigger copper 111 pieces into it and then kneel on them, and then we could put five next to each other. One interesting aspect is we can grow very, very quickly. And then when we remove these, uh, we use the electrochemical delamination, then we can separate the graphene on both sides of the foil very, very quickly within about a minute. And we can actually reuse these foils essentially forever, I think indefinitely because after using them five times, we saw essentially no mass change and no change of their single crystal characteristics and their surface morphology and so on. And uh, Yun Ching in our group is adept at making GFETs and making measurements. And one thing I wanna emphasize is it doesn't matter for this large area graphene, which direction and where you pattern the device, it always performs about the same. So the carrier mobilities for electrons and holes were remarkably uniform throughout the whole film. And with this, I'll close, and then I'll look for, forward to any questions that the audience might have. I see I've gone just a little bit over 60 minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Ruff. And uh, so for all the audience, you, know, you may, um, push your questions um, in from send your questions from all the platforms uh, in Chinese or in English uh, for Chinese I will uh, translate it and discuss them with Professor Ruo and let me check um, so I guess first uh, there's a question about the, the drill heating method for the conversion from hot crystalline material uh, foil to single crystalline uh, foil. So, so what is the temperature difference between the, the, um, the heating area and the melting point of this uh, metal? Ah, that's is a good that, question. Yeah, yeah, so the melting temperature of platinum foil, because it's fairly thick, uh, is going to be the bulk melting temperature about 1,770 degrees Celsius. And so indeed we adjusted the temperature in the central region uh, mm -hmm. to be, for example, around 1,650. And okay. uh, it, we find it's very important to be pretty close to the melting temperature to get this colossal grain growth to happen in these face-centered cubic metal mm -hmm. foils. There is another aspect uh, that I didn't go into detail, but we do discuss in our, our mm -hmm. paper in 2018 in science about the starting, what is referred to as texture, the starting nature of the grains turns out to be important. And so it's the funny thing is certain foils from certain suppliers, they will work well, so to speak, and foils from other suppliers don't work so well. 
and so in the joule heating, we would use a pyrometer to measure the temperature distribution, for example. And so we don't have 1,650 uniformly throughout the whole uh, region that I'm emphasizing here with the cursor, because this is the region where there's water cooling yeah. at the electrodes. And so there is a temperature gradient, but it's very sharp. And then it quickly goes up to around 1650 for this center region. Another very important thing are these, what I call inclusions. And we, we sometimes can have them mm -hmm. in our copper foils and nickel and cobalt. And those uh, can be very valuable for other studies. So they will mm -hmm. be single crystal of a certain HKL orientation. And one can undertake a growth study of something, for example, where you have that present at the same time as the 111. Okay. It's a very nice, it's a very nice question. Joule heating is very useful. Uh, however, to do it at a very large scale, at least for platinum and palladium, mm -hmm. since there are furnaces that are available that can go to 2000 degrees C, like the MTI furnace that we bought after this was published and now have set up. Um, those are a little more convenient. <laughs> But I think mm -hmm. if, you know, if, if someone wants to undertake the challenge of trying to convert tungsten or a molybdenum, mm -hmm. which is very exciting, I think, to yeah. somehow achieve single crystal, the melting temperatures are so high, it might be necessary to do it by joule heating, or you build a, something like a graphite furnace, and you're going to try to use direct heating, thermal heating through such a special furnace, for example. So do you think it's possible to do an in situ observation of this uh, with like the assistance of certain techniques? Ah, that's a great question. Our uh, center, we're lucky to have Dr. Wan Kiong uh, in our song, Dr. Wan Kiong Song, who's a wonderful uh, physicist who loves to build new equipment. And so we now have five or six jewel heating systems that have water jacketed uh, uh -huh. chambers. Those are typically having quartz windows. And we do do things like videotape uh, jewel heating. And mm -hmm. fascinating is the, you know, for example, in those other systems, uh, we can heat, uh, let us say, a tungsten foil to 3000 degrees C in about 10 seconds. And then we oh. can... Amazing. Turn off, yeah, it's very interesting. We can turn off the current and cool down to room temperature. Maybe it takes 15 or 20 seconds just from natural cooling. And that's because of the small thermal inertia or thermal mass, if you like. Uh, the thermal load is small in these foils. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, those are very exciting directions for our research, which we are doing now. And other people will find those to be interesting directions. Is, to observe with your carefully with your eye, you want to wear appropriate goggles, <laughs> and maybe and put a put a green probably. glass. Yeah, put a green glass over it, or more safely videotape it. Uh, but yes, one can learn a lot by those sorts of time dependent uh, visual observations of what's happening. So, do you think it's possible to do this in TM in situ? Um, it's very challenging because, for example, our metal foils are between about 20 micron thickness and maybe oh. up to about 100 micron thickness. So, oh, okay. uh, yeah, yeah. So, TEM is, is becoming is a very interesting question of trying to observe this sort of grain growth or some sort of grain growth and coalescence and so on. People do those experiments mm. in TEM, in variable temperature TEM, in situ right. studies, but a direct connection to, uh, for example, our studies on foils is difficult. Oh yeah. Yeah, because of the thickness. Yeah, so here's the second question also related to this one, uh, because you have done uh, a series uh, materials like the platinum, palladium, copper, iron, and also some uh, alloy, uh, mm. copper, nickel alloy, right? Yes. So, Considering there's this uh, different types of uh, which we call the intermetallic compounds, 
a special yes. kind of alloy. So is this possible for like something like the PT cobalt? Like it would be a different thing. No, no, I, I, I will answer humbly, which is I don't know, yeah. but, I, but I encourage uh, and I suggest that there will be a lot of opportunities for revisiting uh, what surface scientists have studied for many years, including many years ago, you know, the, mm-hmm. the study of these surface alloys and surface, we call it a sur- superstructure, intermetallic yep. uh, compound that might be a very thin layer at the surface that has a periodic structure and it's totally different composition than the bulk metal below it uh, is really fascinating. There's a sort of surface thermodynamics. Uh, And I think uh, revisiting some of what is already done, but with the foils now in very large area, as well as discovering new uh, mixtures and periodic structures will be very robust area to go into because these foils are really inexpensive and they're only going to get better and better. There's the very nice work from Kai Hui Lu's group at Peking University and some work from Zhang Fan Lu's group and then uh, also from KP Lo. Some other very nice papers where the uh, have gone beyond the 111 orientation, for example, to generate other HKL uh, uh, surface orientations over significant regions, like multi-centimeters or even larger. So let's take a step back in time before this was possible with these foils and uh, ask ourselves, what would we do if we wanted to do a single crystal study? Well, we would buy a single crystal from one of the companies that grows those single crystals by Chakralsky growth or by the Bridgman method, and they grow a big bool, B-O-U-L-E, and Mm. then they slice it and they polish it. And that's great. And you get a certain orientation that you pay several thousand dollars for. And that's one crystal. And then you try to do everything you can with it. And so a lot of beautiful surface science and so on has been done on those sorts of single crystals. But these foils, I think they open up tremendous opportunities for doing new work because they can be pretty, very inexpensive, I think, in the long run. So yeah, I think that I'm very optimistic, but I I don't particularly know for sure whether palladium, cobalt can or can't be done. But I do know we and you can make the palladium 111 mm-hmm. and perhaps and perhaps other orientations as well over you know multi centimeters and then you can try to add the cobalt by electroplating by perhaps vapor deposition etc and study that so it will be very exciting okay so uh, there is a question for me and mm-hmm. for me so as you mentioned, the, the hydrogen participation will have a different role in the conversion of like um, PT, PT versus mm-hmm. the nickel thing or the, the cobalt. So mm-hmm. uh, nickel, uh, copper, something, uh, they yes. will be different for both sides. So my question is, is there any difference in the void formation or the different fusion or the conversion uh, when you compare those CP structure because, because they have different stacking <coughs> density. You uh, had this observation by someone about the hydrogen. And as, as I mentioned, you know, the activation uh, enthalpy, let us say, or energy for the vacancy formation. Mm-hmm being low in platinum, and then the hydrogen doesn't play much role, but it plays a role in, in copper, nickel, and cobalt because that activation enthalpy is high. Uh, Professor Feng Ding and his team members played very important role in terms of modeling you know, that uh, vacancy formation and also how that could play a role in motion of the grain boundary. So I think it's extremely exciting to try to expand the list of materials studied, but I, I should know, 
while we attempted with iron to sort of do the same thing, it didn't work at all. Oh. And uh, we needed to go into the literature and find what uh, other people who study grain uh, growth and these sorts of issues, such as metallurgists have done with iron. Iron was complicated or is complicated by the fact that there's a martensitic transformation. Yeah. So if, as we heated our iron foil, for example, we use the jewel heater or we put it in a, a high temperature oven we have access to now. When we cooled it back down, it was totally wrinkled and deformed. <laughs> so it had undergone the martensitic transformation. And then when we cooled back down, we saw that evidence of that, you know, sort of transformation in its morphology. And so we actually needed to pre-strain the iron foil in a particular way while heat treating to a certain temperature and then deliberately avoid mm -hmm. uh, crossing the martensitic transformation temperature to achieve the single crystal iron foils. And in a way, our work was closely paralleling work that had been done by others, but on bigger chunks of material, not on foils per se. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think your question is very apt. You know, I think this is an area for discovery for people to pioneer a uh, new understanding you know, how do we access BCC and other, uh, other than the uh, closest packed metals, because it's very exciting to think that we could convert those sorts of foils to other HKL single crystal. So I don't know how that will so, all turn out. Yeah, I think the question, the question point, is very good. Yeah. yeah, because from my point of view, I think as BCC has a lower packing density, I think maybe the, the the temperature difference between the the general heating temperature and the melting point would be allowed to be a bigger temperature difference. Yeah, that could be. And also, I should note that uh, temperature gradients are not something that we have explored. Mm -hmm. In the future, our group, uh, due to addition of a new talented postdoc, and then we we might invite you know have another person in the future who will be very interested in these metal foils. Mm -hmm. But we want to explore some of the things done by the other groups that I mentioned, mm -hmm. like the Peking U groups uh, and uh, KP Lowe's group at NUS or, or other methods that, that uh, our new postdoc will discover. But we have typically done our conversions essentially isothermally. I mean, this is uh, not isothermal because it's a strong temperature gradient here, but there was a large region in the center that was essentially isothermal. Okay. But in our other experiments, we've always hung the foils off of quartz rods or ceramic rods. Uh, and then we've been working with large scale furnaces that have essentially a constant temperature zone. So I think the other groups have you know, introduced temperature gradients, and that can be very, very powerful. And so that's something that should also be tried with the BCC mm -hmm. metals, and then trying different geometries, not only just foils, but I think exploring some other shapes will be very interesting. And so that I think it's, it's, it's very wide open for exploration and clever new approaches. Okay. So oh, here's the next question. It's about uh, the also about this conversion based on the copper nickel one 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 foil. So mm -hmm. because copper nickel could be both surface oxidized. So have you ever studied the surface um, like oxidation or the presence of residue oxygen on the conversion? Ah. Let me just think for a moment. Excuse me. I would say we haven't explored that because uh, we, after electroplating, would typically anneal with some hydrogen present. Okay. So it's a good question. Uh, it's a very good question. And, you know, controlling 
the extent of oxidation and also would acetic acid work as well on these copper nickel uh, you know, mixtures or alloys as it does on copper itself for stripping off the oxide layer. I think these sorts of questions are very good questions that I don't have answers to. We haven't really explored that, but it could play important role or other surface uh, mixtures or functionalization of the surfaces in certain ways could potentially influence the transformation. Okay. So, uh, so the next question would be um, the will the impurity in the metallic substrate affect the growth of large scale graphene? Ah, okay, that's a very good question. Let me try to just find a picture that we could use. Let's see. Just to show islands. Uh, for example, here. So there's many interesting questions if we have nucleation occurring in more than one spot. So just, just to mention, there are very interesting papers where groups have chosen the path of having just one nucleus uh, allowed, so to speak. If others grow, they make mm -hmm. them disappear and then they grow that one larger and larger and larger. So that the audience should be aware there is that sort of work that has been published is very interesting too. And the other option is that nucleation occurs in a variety of different spots. And then those nuclei, they're going to grow. Uh, then do they grow with perfect epitaxy, for example, and then after they grow to the point where they could potentially connect, do they connect perfectly or not? Mm -hmm. These are very interesting questions. Um, our work suggests to us, and this is a rather long story, but through collaborations with other groups such as Peter Boggild and colleagues in Denmark who make, uh, let's say, terahertz conductivity measurements over a very, very large area, then they get very uniform response from our single crystal graphene. But, but let's be fair. Uh, how strict do we want to be when we talk about a single crystal? And so even if you buy that single crystal that I described that was grown by Chakrowski growth or Bridgman growth, is it absolutely everywhere a perfect single crystal? You know, so as we look at the large area graphene film, you know, that might be very large area, like 10 centimeter by 50 centimeter or something like that, on the copper 111 single crystal, could there be a region where there's a slight uh, grain boundary, a, a very you know small angle grain boundary grown region because there's not perfect matching? Of course, I can't say for certain that there isn't because we don't have any method of probing over such length scales at the atomic scale. So it's a really, Good question. Uh, how uh, well do we grow, let's say, single crystal graphene? And I think there's a variety of measurements like the GFET measurements that I referred to that address this and can hand off these new samples to colleagues who make those sorts of large area measurements and so on. But I think it's a very good question. Okay. So Here's another question about the uh, uh, F diamine. Mm -hmm. So, because you used uh, the xenium difluoride as a um, precursor for fluorine, so is there any possibilities <coughs> that you can grow with this method to prepare uh, doped F diamine, for instance, uh, chloride, uh, chlorine for fluorine, <coughs> or hydrogen for fluorine? Yeah, I think those are very. Uh, interesting directions to pursue. Now, the calculations suggest that chlorine is too big and we won't be able to get to the stoichiometry C2Cl. Mm -hmm. uh, that would generate the diamine interlayer bonding perfectly. But that doesn't mean it's not worth trying uh, or trying with mixtures. With hydrogenation, that's 
I think extremely important. The thing is uh, how to drive the hydrogenation to completion. Mm -hmm. So no one has done that with graphene itself and no one has done that with multi-layer stacks. And so it's still a good challenge, I think, to try to make the C2H. Uh, C1H1 has not been made, but the term graphene has appeared in the literature. So extensively hydrogenated monolayer has been achieved, but I don't think the C1H1 has been achieved. So I think it's a really good question. Uh, could we take our F diamine and perhaps displace the fluorines in some clever chemistry with hydrogens? So some chemist invents the chemistry that will do that. Uh, just to mention something else to the audience that I'm kind of excited about is what is the largest single crystal diamond film that can currently be grown? Well, uh, in Japan and China and other countries, people continue to expand the lateral dimensions. And that's a bit of a long story, but I don't know what it currently is. It, it might be something like, you know, maybe possibly uh, several centimeters by several centimeters, single crystal, and then you grow with plasma enhanced CBD. So it's not the high pressure, high temperature method. Now, what if in the future, somebody in the world, maybe my team, maybe others, they get AB bilayer graphene over 20 centimeter by 20 centimeter, very beautiful. And then we convert that to F-diamine, let's say it works really well and we can convert the whole thing to F-diamine. Now, if some clever chemist can figure out how to take the CF bonds and add carbon and build upwards, then we can potentially make diamond. Uh, and we'd have it be really large area. So, you know, there's some really exciting directions. And I think the question about hydrogen and chlorine and other functionalities is very good. And could we make types of structures like Janus type structures that have maybe CH on one side and CF on the other? It'd be yeah. very interesting in terms of the surface dipoles. So the yeah. CF bond, you know, it has a real dipole moment and the CH bond does too. This is for the audience's uh, information, but the diamond community knows this very well. Um, single crystal diamond uh, has, when it is very well hydrogenated on its surface, has a negative electron affinity. So you don't have to apply an electric field. You can actually have electrons just spontaneously <laughs> come off the diamond into the vacuum. Kind Ooh. of fascinating. Uh, typically people apply a, a field. Well, this is very exciting because then, uh, you know, the ability to create electron beams and so on and have them be very low initial kinetic energy. So small energy input and has very many interesting possibilities. That happens as a consequence of the CH bond being a dipole. And so mm -hmm. there's a built-in electric field at the surface. In our diamine, there's two built-in electric fields on each side, but they completely uh, cancel <laughs> each other. Oh, yeah. yeah. Right. But if you yeah. had CF on one side and CH on the other, they wouldn't. And so I've had fun conversations with Pavel about, you know, how can we possibly do this and so on. And okay, so yeah. Mm, yeah. in that case, as the man, uh, as the phenomenon you mentioned, uh, is this uh, like mm, the intrinsic field, electric field, uh, laying outside of the material and the atoms? So has this been ever identified in any other materials? I think a good example is diamond itself. And so there's been really nice studies on single crystal diamond that can be very, very highly, uh, how to say, polished or made very smooth and then hydrogenated mm -hmm. or, or fluorinated. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah, can be fluorinated. And then one can look at these sorts of issues with surface science methods in great detail. Now, the fun thing about the F diamine mm -hmm. is that perhaps other methods can be brought to bear. Uh, because it's so thin. Mm 
So it, it may open up opportunities, of course, with bulk diamond, we have one surface and we can try to study that surface with the many surface science techniques available and uh, scanning probe methods and, and so on to try to figure out the field distribution and where is it sort of centroid, so to speak, or central plane located and things like this. But with these thin films, it may open up new opportunities. I forgot to mention to the audience because I showed you, you know, one example of TEM in which we had the AB bilayer graphene and then converted mm -hmm. to the F-diamine still on the copper nickel 111, but we also uh, delaminated or removed the bilayer graphene onto nickel or gold TEM grids, which are resistant to attack by fluorine. And then Pavel converted those into F-diamine as well. So we also did it for those sorts of suspended films. And so the F-diamine can be uh, suspended or it can be perhaps transferred to other surfaces of your choice. So it's, it's, I think it's a wide open topic for more research. So, so what is the basic um, physical or chemical properties of this diamine or F diamine? Is is this uh, like say insulator or a semiconductor? I, I guess I would guess it would be insulator, right? Right. It's a good question. Where do we draw the line between insulator and? Uh, so I went through this rather quickly. Band gap. The band gaps at about three point three electron okay. volt would be a wide band gap semiconductor. Yeah. I would say. That's right. That's right. And that's why the you know the very high mobilities that are calculated at this point uh, are kind of fascinating because I wouldn't have guessed that because of it being a moderate to wide band gap semiconductor. The calculations by Professor Quark's group. Uh, I show the pictures here are that it's a direct band gap, but we have not in our group measured whether it's indirect or direct. So it's also an interesting question in terms of potential applications. So, and then as I had mentioned this ability to, I think it could be done through local heating. It can mm -hmm. be done by an E-beam. I think there's a reasonable chance that we can drive defluorination perhaps with certain wavelength UV light, you know, perhaps eczema laser, et cetera. We haven't explored that. You know, the ability to, again, if we can get really large area, high quality to pattern it locally and then have AB graphene separated by the F diamine and do that for uh, devices is, is promising. I, you know, I think it might need to be like all of the other 2D materials eventually for real applications uh, embedded uh, would be useful direction to probe that. Okay, so I guess, oh, so I, th I, think, uh, I think a little bit further answer she is that therefore, at least so far in our studies, it's not as stable as PTFE, oh, yeah. you know, a, a, as robust. It's a little, it seems to be a little more reactive, but I think that, I don't want to uh, make a firm statement because I think it needs to be studied more. Okay, uh, here's the last question from the audience. The, is the quality of the graphene grown at a low temperature CVD uh, better than the, those uh, prepared from a high pressure? Is there any correlation? Well, let me address the pressure aspect. So these uh, graphenes that we describe in this recently published article, they actually were grown at quote high pressure. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think the issue of the CVD parameters remains very interesting and should be continued to be explored, you know, mm -hmm. by the growth community. And so, uh, since our, our pressure was moderately high, I think that our exploration here was focused primarily on temperature effects. And you know, as the audience reads the paper, you'll see 
we ended up discovering, and this had been also previously, I think, observed to some degree in environmental SEM and studies by Zhijin Wang, uh, environmental SEM studies where evidence of a surface reconstruction around 750 degrees C was seen, and we, we cite that study. But in our work, we find that, uh, let us say we, we grow with either ethylene or methane at something like uh, 1300 Kelvin. And then when we cool down, we ended up learning or discovering that around 1030 Kelvin, pretty abruptly, right? In a narrow temperature range, we get a tremendous surface reconstruction happens. And uh, this graphene that was growing at 1300 K is suddenly in this combined system of graphene and copper nickel surface and so on. We don't really understand what drives that thermodynamics, but I would say we have a, an idea from Professor Feng Ding. So a very nice physical review letters article has been published in which if one thinks about the mechanics of the graphene as playing a role, then the, if you start with our copper 111 surface that we get right after we do the conversion of the polycrystalline copper to the single crystal, it is remarkably flat and it has pretty much only single steps. And then it has large area plateaus that are perfect single crystal and then a single step that's only a few angstroms in height, and then you have a large plateau again. Very interestingly, after we grow graphene and then cool from such a high temperature down to room temperature, we, we see these bunch steps. And uh, the explanation, I, I don't have the PRL paper right in front of me that Professor Ding suggested was, if you form bunch steps instead of having a lot of small steps, uh, where you have a lot of curvature of the graphene that increases the uh, energy rather than lowering the energy. If you have step bunches, then the graphene is not going to have so many bent regions. I don't, you know, sort of curved regions. Mm -hmm. They're going to be mostly uh, plateau and then running down along the step. Let me try to find the AFM data that I uh, had. Yeah, for example, this schematic here. Mm -hmm. So we have a plateau and then we have a step and then we have plateau. So the idea being if this is fairly tall, then the curvature here and curvature here increases the energy, but we don't have a lot of you know, curved regions in between because we don't have a lot of those tiny steps. So one possible explanation is that one. And uh, we ended up learning that uh, at least the deadhesion doesn't occur from surface reconstruction if we grow at a low enough temperature. And we also think from Dalo's detailed study of the step structures, I'm not sure I have it all here on the slides here, that the step structures themselves are different uh, in fact, I, here it is, it is here. Um, you can see that the steps we get with the graphene coating when we grew at high temperature are quite different than they, they look when we grew at low temperature. Mm -hmm. or the transition temperature right around 1030 K or a little bit below that. So there's something different about the surface reconstruction that happens that also is not driving the formation of these tall, tall wrinkles, or that better put, is not driving the deadhesion. And that I think deserves to be better understood, including in the mechanics community should take a very careful look at our paper. So that was a long answer. Uh, do I think the graphene is a higher quality? Then we come to uh, what does quality mean to different people? You know, and I think. To device uh, engineers, it's very appealing because, let me show you uh, this slide again. Uh, this one, okay, yeah. 
So, you know, if you, if you please take a look at this advanced materials paper, for example, and also this ACS Nano, but particularly this paper, we really focused in on the single crystal graphene, but also the folds that are unavoidably present mm -hmm. at that time growing on the single crystal copper 111. Now, the graphene between the folds that uh, Yun Ching pattern devices on, its performance is quite similar to the performance of the GFETs pattern in any direction as described here. But the problem is the folds, even though they don't take up that much area, they're running for centimeters in length along that copper 111 and they're separated by a few hundred microns. And the devices that have the fold present in the active region, they don't perform nearly as well as the GFETs that have the active region without the fold present. And so I think this is much higher quality in that respect. You know, we don't really have to worry about patterning between the folds, but I wanted to mention that the graphene sort of seems similar in the two different cases. So, you know, I think that we need to look at other properties and that's always a sort of ongoing discussion of, you know, how good is the graphene and by what standard and by yeah, who's maybe mobility, who's, yeah, whose perspective, yeah. right? And so, people interested in devices, they want to know about mobility, yeah. And uh, and then I think the mobility here is is both very good and remarkably uniform. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, you know, the other properties that might be of interest, like thermal conductivity and so on, still remain to be explored, mm -hmm. uh, right. Okay, uh, I think uh, that all the questions I've collected for this moment. So I will thank Professor Ruf again for his wonderful talk and uh, his humble explanation. Okay. And uh, because I think all the audience today will have, uh, have learned a lot from this speech mm -hmm. and uh, uh, I'd like to um, uh, Thank you again. So uh, I would also yeah. wish Professor Roof would uh, get more knowledge during his uh, future research and uh, probably okay. uh, later on give us more wonderful <coughs> results and understanding on this topic. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Ho, and for the audience as well. I really appreciate the very okay. nice opportunity. Thank you very much. Okay, hope to see you again. Okay, bye-bye.